Welcome to Digital Asset News. Take the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, we really got two stories. And first up, two Bitcoin billionaires revealed they're now holding huge amounts of Ethereum and Robert Kiyosaki from Rich Dad Poor Dad author states or asked the question, who is not getting paid? And it's an important question to ask. And the answer is pretty surprising. And I know some people love him or hate him, but the information that he puts out is pretty interesting. And those are the two stories that are going to lead us down to a pretty deep rabbit hole. But first, let's take a look at what is going on in the market today. So Bitcoin uh, had a big uh, or a little little loss and it went to, I think, around 88.40. Now it's up to 9,020. It is Sunday, May 24th, around 4.30 p.m. Texas time. And uh, this is the price that we have. Ethereum still holding strong at 206. Tether now at 3. XRP has dropped down to 4th. Interesting. And uh, there is a project or a coin that I'm looking for it is and there it is Omisego or OMG it is now at a dollar sixty I want to take a look at this and there's a specific reason why I'm looking at this I want to see if there was actually an increase in what was happening over time so it looks like over the last seven days 14 days and 30 days it's gone up over 170 percent and the reason why is because Coinbase is apparently going to list OMG or Omisego. So this ought to be an interesting prospect. Now what's interesting about, o about OMG or Omisego is that it is a Ethereum token and also a smart contract. So this is one to look out for. Uh, we'll see how it goes over the time, but uh, who knows, could be a very big thing. And I think the uh, Coinbase pump uh, may be in effect, even though it is down right now, but we'll see what happens over time. All right, let's jump into today's stories. So first up, two Bitcoin billionaires reveal their big holders of Ethereum. And uh, this is just the uh, Winklevoss twins, the owners of Gemini. And it starts out by saying in a new interview with Camila Russo of The Defiant, Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss, co-founders of crypto exchange Gemini, say they are large investors in Ethereum, the second most valuable cryptocurrency by market cap. First of all, I was like, what the heck is The Defiant? And so I had to look it up. And The Defiant is actually a Spotify podcast. And I just thought, hmm, interesting. More people are going to Spotify, perhaps. Uh, because of the story that, uh, uh, if you don't know, Joe Rogan of the Joe Rogan Experience, who has 200 million plus downloads, views, uh, listings, all those things for different uh, platforms. He is taking his show exclusively to Spotify and a $100 million deal. We covered that and why uh, I really believe that it is a going to be a big boom for free speech uh, as far as like getting things off of one particular platform and uh, onto another one. So uh, we'll see how that works out but just thought it was interesting that uh, Winklevoss twins go to a podcast that's on Spotify anyhow so what is this all about they state we definitely own a lot of ether they're large and it's a material amount yes quite large I think it's safe to say material by any personal standards like anybody's wealth amount and they go on to say it's very sizable a couple years back we made a concerted effort to buy a lot of ether and a couple of years back uh, 2017 <clears throat> reached an all-time high of fourteen hundred dollars so I don't know how much they bought back then right now it's worth two hundred dollars so I think maybe they're they have the ability to see far ahead like they did when they invest into Bitcoin and I see it. Uh, I see it as a ten thousand dollar coin. So, I think it's a pretty good buy right now. We'll see what happens in the future. So, talking about foresight, in two thousand thirteen, the twins revealed they own a hundred and twenty thousand Bitcoin, which is equivalent to one percent of all Bitcoin in circulation at the time. With Bitcoin now hovering at around 9,000, the value of the Bitcoin trove is now over $1 billion, so good for them. And finally it says, if the twin stake in Ethereum is comparable to their Bitcoin investment, Tyler and Cameron could be holding about 4% of all Ethereum in circulation. So here's the question. So we're always talking on this channel about decentralization. Decentralization, getting things away from the control or power structure of a centralized unit. So do you believe that the intention of Satoshi Nakamoto and his Bitcoin project, that 1% of all Bitcoin should be or would be in the hands of two guys? And what about other billionaires that we don't even know about? Because they're all over the place. We don't know whose wallet is whose. We don't know really what's, uh, you know, who can really be tracked to a particular person if you really want to take a look at it. Uh, we can, we know that there are wallets out there. We don't know exactly who exactly that wallet is in. That's not Jane Doe or John Smith or whatever else or, or Paul Tudor Jones is, is a, a Bitcoin wallet. So the question is, do you believe that that is the intention? And then the same thing for Vitalik Buter. 
Friedrin, when he made Ethereum, do you think it was his intention that uh, two guys would have 4% of all Ethereum in existence and that will be decentralized? Let me know what you think in the comment section below. And this actually leads into our next story. So I think there's something going on with Ethereum and it's why it is one of my seven holdings. Actually, eight now. So uh, I have invested into Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, Chainlink, Cardano, EOS, Tezos, and also Stellar. And uh, the, when I talk about these different projects and I, and I talk about these in, uh, in, in the videos, it's because I'm biased. So you have to understand that uh, these things that I talk about, I'm talking about them because I own them. I try to take bias away, but you can only do so. So you can only do so much with what you have. So now we're going to talk about Ethereum addresses holding over 100 Ethereum hits new all time high. And I can tell you, I think things are bright for the Ethereum project. So what's happening is that according to the latest report by Glassnode, the number of Ethereum holders with more than 100 Ethereum coins has now reached a whopping 47,722 addresses, which is now a new all-time high. It's important to note that the number of holders with more than 100 Ethereum coins has been increasing since 2016 with barely any downside. And this is uh, metrics from Glassnode. They take a look at uh, different uh, data that is out there as far as in the cryptocurrency digital asset space. And they can just tell us, look, there's a ton of, of wallets out there and they have 100 plus coins. So I think there's something going on. Clearly, it states, the interest in the digital asset is strong despite its decline in price. In fact, from 2017 to 2018, after the massive bull run that took the Ethereum up to $1,400, the number of holders has increased tremendously from only around 17,000 to 45,000 in early 2019. So the rest of the article isn't uh, so fantastic, so I'm just going to stop right there. But I feel that there's two reasons why people are investing heavily. Well, I really, you could say three reasons of why people are investing heavily into Ethereum. First and foremost, everything's built in Ethereum. All ERC, there's a ton of ERC, you know, ERC 20 tokens, and, you know, Everything is just built around or on a, the Ethereum platform. I mean, look, the project we just talked about, Omi Say Go or OMG, is an Ethereum coin. So if you take a look at um, any type of data out there, you'll see a lot of things are built on Ethereum, and it's only going to uh, continue in that same regard. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one I can say is price, and this makes more sense to me. So if your price right now is around $200, and your all-time high was $1,400, well, that's... Uh, that's a 7x right there that you can do uh, just by investing right now. Now, taking on, on the flip side, if you invested, uh, if you try to get you know, one Bitcoin at $9,000 or, or whatever you put in, it, it, it doesn't matter. Percentages are percentages. So if uh, Bitcoin to get to its all-time high, it was kind of in that range of doubling. So 9,000, 20,000, you know, 2.2x, whatever else it is. So whatever you put in uh, just to get down, just to get back to its all-time high, 2.2x. So if you're looking at um, your return on investment, and if you don't think that Ethereum cannot get back to its all-time high, then maybe you wouldn't invest into it. Uh, me personally, I am putting more money into Ethereum than I am into Bitcoin because I believe that Ethereum, again, is a $10,000 coin. And I do believe that it will be very easy to get back to its all-time high, especially with everything is built on Ethereum, decentralized finance, and it has a very active group. So I will be investing in Ethereum. And the third thing, if you look at it, is Ethereum 2.0, which is staking and sharding. And I always laugh when I say sharding, but uh, it's because I'm a big kid. But staking, uh, staking is, you know, you can uh, create passive income just by owning 32 uh, Ethereum. And right now, it's a lot easier to buy 32 Ethereum at $200 than 32 Ethereum at $1,400. So we actually uh, took a look at that and covered the story as far as what Ethereum 2.0 is, uh, what it would take to actually stake everything and the different time frames that's going to, to uh, follow along to when it actually becomes active as far as the Ethereum 2.0. And that's in a video that I'll link at the very end. And uh, we go over that in detail and also in a summary. So we'll take a look at that. And those are my those are my reasons. So if you haven't invested in Ethereum, uh, I can't tell you what to invest in. I can only tell you what I am doing personally. Uh, but uh, that is what uh, I think is going to happen. All right, let's move on. Next up, Robert Kiyosaki. So some people love him, some people hate him. But uh, he does ask good questions and he has great points. And he has a, he had a tweet I thought was pretty interesting. He says, look, Mall of America in Minnesota. 
this is Minnesota, United States. I don't know where uh, you're at uh, for wherever you're watching this video. If you're in Canada or you're from in uh, Mexico, Europe, uh, Australia, India. I know there's a lot of different places. Switzerland. Uh, everybody, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. But uh, Mall of America is this just enormous... <laughs> just a huge structure in Minnesota and it's a vast sprawling mall which has just a bunch of retail shops and places you can go to that's like an indoor roller coaster uh, never been there looks pretty cool probably won't ever go there but whatever um, it uh, Robert Kiyosaki states here look Mall of America will miss its second payment on its 1.4 billion mortgage let that sink in this huge place, this enormous retail shops that go on forever, is going to miss its second payment on its $1.4 billion mortgage. An, intelli an intelligent question is, who is not getting paid? And I thought about that. I'm like, hmm, who is not getting paid? So if you have to take a look at it, really, it's the banks. Uh, the banks would have to bankroll something that large. However, there could be other businesses out there that could have all grouped together and also been a secondary funding, who knows? But there is somebody who is missing out on a lot of payments. Now, uh, if it is a private, investor sure but banks not only bankroll these huge retail places or commercial places but also they're they might be on the hook for retail so there was an article in z crypto talks about how bitcoin leaves banking stocks in the dust as imf warrants banks are in for major losses and it goes back to exactly what robert kiyosaki was saying who's not getting paid the banks and this one states right here as we scroll down the pandemic could cause banks to increase fee income to alleviate pressure on profits banks that take excessive risks to recoup profit might have bigger losses in the future regardless of the steps banks take they need or the need to strategize to reduce oncoming losses is apparent as all sectors have been hit by the pandemic so there is a problem that is brewing in the background and i don't think it's something that people talk about too much but it's happening and this was an article by forbes and this is from jesse colombo this was uh, about a month ago and it talks about why the u.s commercial real estate bubble is about to burst didn't get a lot of attention and i can see why it's not kind of, it's pretty dry but as we see things moving forward what could happen with all these different uh, commercial properties who have who have rented these spaces out but businesses can't open because of the pandemic where does the money come from well you're going to have to do something because someone's not getting paid and the fed can only bail bail everything out for so long and then even when the economy starts to come back how long is it going to take before these people can actually get money back into the hands of the people who have lent them that money that is the real question and i think it's going to take a very long time it's not going to be like a flip of a switch i could be wrong but i think it could be six months 12 months to 18 months before we start to see some traction anyhow this article states, as a result of the Federal Reserve stimulus monetary policies, U.S. commercial property prices have more than doubled since their 2009 low. So everybody was buying in. This is a great time. Let's really get into retail space or commercial space. And here we are. However, <clears throat> ultra low interest rates encourage a borrowing boom in which commercial real estate loans at U.S. banks surged by $863 billion or 62% since 2012. And this was just on you know predicated on the economy just continuously going up and never failing and we just thought it would just go on to infinity because it's the it's the economy stupid and there should be no problems what what can go up will keep going up and i think it was just a pipe dream and i think that pipe dream is about to burst so Finally, to finish up, it states retail commercial real estate was already hanging by a thread due to the retail apocalypse that was occurring as tens of thousands of stores closed in recent years, with many more expected to close in the years ahead. So for commercial property, you have to understand... <clears throat> It's not like it just goes month to month. I mean, you're locked in for you know two, three, five years sometimes for contracts, and uh, and and this is just for the shops that are there right then. Now you have to take a look at the people who have actually built those strip malls or those huge re, uh, spaces for retail shops. Uh, they're on the hook for you know millions upon millions, maybe even billions, like Mall of America. But we have to ask ourselves, well, who is really benefiting right there? And I can tell you exactly who it is. It is Amazon. So. If Amazon had never come along, maybe this wouldn't have been exacerbated as it has so much. But you can see how retail shops are going out like lights as time goes on because Amazon is gobbling up everything. Look, I am a seller on Amazon and I can just tell you from experience that a lot of people 
<laughs> and even more so now, are all going into Amazon and they are just flooding in because um, I here's a story. Even me who sell who sells on Amazon six months ago, I wouldn't really buy too much on Amazon. I'm like I'm just gonna go to the store because it's right down the down the street. Now that uh, I can't go down to the store like I'd like to because there's you know it's hard to get into. I got to wear a mask and you know there's a huge line. Now everything's on Amazon and uh, as this has forced people to do that, I think they're starting to realize like hey wait, I can save a lot of time. I can have it delivered to my house. It's super simple and the prices are competitive if not cheaper. And I can spend more time with my, uh, you know, family and loved ones uh, because I don't have to go out of the store and wait in line and do all that that nonsense. I might use Amazon a little bit more. So now the cat's out of the bag. So when we take a look at Amazon and we take a look at the stock prices. Here's just one month, right? This is one month, and it's just been like a seesaw pattern. So, eh, whatever. If we if we zoom out, when in doubt, zoom out. Six months, we saw the crash. But look how it was doing over here. 2,170.22, crash hit to 1785. Look where it's at now, 2,375, 20, 2,315. Now it's, it's all the way up to 2,449. Year to date, looks even better. One year, five years, max. So can you tell the way that things are going? All of these shops, all these places are going to have a real hard time. Amazon's taking over and... I see the next big bubble potentially happening. Now, I could be wrong. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. Uh, it's always interesting to read what you, what you guys say. So let me know, and let's go on to the next part. So this next story builds on what we were just talking about. And the problem with the banks is that they're going to face a crunch of people not being able to pay, just like in 2008, with the housing bubble. So if you have also now a commercial real estate bubble, and you have a lot of people who can't pay maybe on the uh, retail side, also on private housing. What are you going to do? Well, one of the things you can do is try to fight your double-edged uh, front because they're being attacked from places where they can't get money in because people don't have money. The Fed is trying to bail them out. There's only so much time that can happen. And then also they have this third, this third problem, which is cryptocurrency digital assets. So what do you do? Well, you can put out a nice little report like this one where it says digital currencies pose a critical risk to dollar dom dominance and swift. So says JP Morgan analysts. So let's take a look and I can summarize it in just a couple paragraphs. Analysts at JP Morgan, including Josh Younger, head of U.S. interest rate derivative strategy and Michael Feroli, chief U.S. economist, wrote in the report as cited in Bloomberg. They state there is no country with more to lose from the disruptive potential of digital currency than, than the U.S. This resolves primarily around U.S. dollar hegemony, hegemony, issuing the global reserve currency and the medium of exchange for international trade in commodities, goods, and services conveys immense advantages. So what they're saying essentially is the more that digital assets of cryptocurrency gains a foothold, the more of a problem the United States has. And this is going to be their next war cry. Uh, I could be wrong. Let me know what you think in the comments, but I see it happening. And the same thing that is going on now is was a, a story that we covered yesterday. Goldman Sachs is inviting its clients to a Bitcoin call. And what we did is we talked about this in yesterday's video where we also talked about Bitcoin mining. And this whole article comes down to this. The uh, CIO, which is the chief investment officer for Goldman Sachs, Sharman uh, most of our Romani, she has been a um, negative, we could say, on cryptocurrency digital assets, especially on Bitcoin. And what they are doing is they are inviting their uh, all their clients to talk about it and potentially talk about uh, Bitcoin. Now, a lot of people have said that this is a very bullish uh, prospect, and I see it the exact opposite. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually 10 days ago, there was a story where it talked about how JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, uh, they actually have been um, directing their clients to not invest into Bitcoin and actively talking to them and saying, look, this is a bad asset. This is a bubble. This is something that you should never invest into, and it's very awful, and here's why. And it's uh, it's been a problem for other types of hedge fund managers who think they have a client, and then they go to J.P. Morgan or uh, Goldman Sachs, and they say to do the exact opposite. So when people think that this is a bullish thing, I don't see it that way. I think it's going to be one of those calls where they say, hey, look, um, you know, gold is great. 
And gold is great. Grakes has been around for thousands of years. It is fungible. It is divisible. It's a store of value. It's really awesome and da-da-da. But Bitcoin is not. Now, um, like we just talked about uh, in the last article where it says that the banks are going to have to do some kind of like extreme things to actually, uh, you know, recoup some of their losses. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're going to actually bring everybody together and say, hey, look, um, we have a new uh, trust and we're going to get into Bitcoin and we want to have you allocate, you know, one to three percent of your portfolio into Bitcoin and we're going to manage it. Uh, that could be another option. I don't think it's going to be, but if I had to go one way or the other, I think that would be the second option as opposed to them just, you know, poo-pooing it and saying it's just awful. So let me know which way you think this could go. I don't see it going too positive, but eh, it might. And look, that's it for today's video. It's Sunday. It's a nice day. I think we should all get out there, <laughs> not uh, uh, do so much endless scrolling on our phones and watching YouTube videos. Uh, get out there, do something fun because uh, the market will be there tomorrow. No big deal. Uh, also, if you uh, just can't step away from your phone, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Crypto Nobs. He's got a pretty uh, good channel that talks about uh, cryptocurrency. And the reason I, I, I talk about him is because in some of my comment section, I've got some people from Europe who, who just they can't, they can't stand my, my accent. They say I have a ridiculous uh, American accent. I, I think I'm just from the Midwest. I sound like everybody. But uh, if you're from Europe, especially UK, listen to Crypto Nobs. I believe that's where he's from. Uh, that's your that's your guy there. He sounds <laughs> he sounds like uh, 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 that. We'll just say. So yeah, check him out. And uh, before we go, I want to say thanks to all my uh, supporters. Really appreciate it. If you don't know, underneath there's a join now button, and uh, it's. A, you don't get anything special. I don't hold anything back. It's not like I give something to members and non-members. It's it should, it should just say tip. That's really what it is. And uh, for my level one supporters, they pay a couple bucks, and it's like saying thanks for a good video, and I appreciate it. So thanks everybody from level one. That's awesome. Level two, they pay a little bit more, so I give them a shout out. Uh, my man, All Right Soft, who's been holding it down for the Bitcoin uh, mining information. Thank you. Uh, myself, who else? Uh, Dave Plummer, straight talking guy, also has a uh, YouTube channel. Check him out. Grant Sharman, Bruce Wood, great name. Baking Benjamins, second great name. <laughs> Noel Flippin Vegas, Martin Lewin, Michael Ralph, William Howell, Chris Alexander, Tessie Ryusaki, positive, that's a name. And uh, our newest one, Fire Swing Golf. If you uh, are looking for help with your golf game, check out Fire Swing Golf. They got the uh, Hundreds of subscribers, and they talk about golf, which I suck at, so I should probably should look at some other videos. And that's it for today. So, uh, look, thanks for sticking around with me. Appreciate it. Get out there, and uh, see you on the next.